doesn't really matter what level you're kind of playing at. I feel like the next 30 minutes, speaking to Rob, there's going to be stuff in there for you. So Rob plays for the Philippines, and he really goes into detail about his journey from club rugby onto the international stage, and goes into real detail about how he structures his training from a physical standpoint, uh, his nutrition, and also some psych psychological stuff in there as well that I feel like you can get something from. So hopefully you enjoy it. Any feedback's appreciated. Um, so without further ado, enjoy. <laughs> So just start off with, it'd be good to um, obviously have a little chat about obviously your rugby career so far. Um, how you've got to where you are, obviously with the Philippines and yeah, etc. Mate. So how how soon do you want on? What kind of right? mate? Let's go. Let's go. Literally right from the start to yeah to where you are now, if you want. Um, yeah. So growing up, born in Hayward Teeth in, in Sussex, and um, and mum and dad uh, were living in we were living in Peacehaven at the time. Um, then my, my local club, really, I could have chosen between Brighton and Lewis. I'm not sure why my dad chose, but we went to Lewis Rugby Club, uh, which is probably about 20, 30 minutes from where we live. So that's where I started all, all my youth rugby, and you know, learned the fundamentals and, and just, you know, as, as, that, as a kid at that young age, just enjoying the sport. Um, finished playing at Lewis probably 15 or 16 and then went on to move to Hove Colts just because... Their setup was a little bit stronger. I, they had a couple of boys that, that I knew from the Brighton area, um, and I knew I knew the coaches as well. So I thought for my development that would, that would be good. And I think at, at probably around that stage is when I got picked up playing uh, from playing county. Um, that was when I had a year year with with Harlequins. Um, so that was really good for my development. You know, immersing myself with boys that are playing already at a very high level being coached, you know, three, four times a week. So, so that was great. Um, after that, probably around, I think around 18, I went to Worthing College um, for two years and um, was playing my club rugby for Worthing as well. So managed to get a few first team games in National 2 at the time, uh, which was good at 18, you know, that physicality and um, um, a big step up from, you know, college rugby, they're going, going straight into men's rugby. You know, you can't get away with the same thing in, in men, men rugby that you can in college rugby. So so that really shaped me and moulded me, especially at a young age. Um, and then after after I finished college, um, I took a year out, was, was a personal trainer for a year, working at David Lloyd's in Bright, at Brighton Marina, if, if you know the area. Um, and then from there, the, like, the nearest club to me with, with a decent men's setup was Brighton Blues. Um that's predominantly where I spent two, three years playing my men's rugby. Um, and that that's that side of it. And then funnily enough, as playing for Brighton, there was a, a fellow called Ash Heward, who um, I knew at the time. Uh, and during this time when I was playing for Brighton, I was doing my England County stuff as well. So so I got picked up through playing for, for Sussex County. That was under 18s. Um, went through all the trialing processes for that. So, you know, getting picked up for Sussex. Then I was invited to a London and South East training camp. So that was, I believe, probably about two, 200, 250 boys that got selected in London and South East. And then from there, I think they selected a 30-man a squad to play in a regional tournament, um, but, you know, between the North and, and the and the South West. Um, and we won our game. And then from there, I managed to get picked in the final 23. Um for England counties, um, and we went on tour to to, to Holland, and, and again that was good for my experience. You've got a lot of boys there that are already in academies. Um, I, I knew a few of the boys, but that was that was great experience. I was coached by Paul Arnold and, and Rich Williams. I think Richie at the moment is coaching at Cambridge, who are in that one. Um, yeah, so that was great. And then when I when I finished that, I sort of knew that. I asked myself the question, you know, is that it for me in terms of my my progression in England, uh, you know, international honours. And, I, you know, I thought it might be too late um, because usually, and, you know, this is not for all, but if you want a good chance of playing for England top level, you need to be picked up when you're 16, 17. You need to be put in good enough to be put in top academies, you know, your, your Harlequins, your, your Baths. Um, and... and so from there, after you know, after sort of making that decision and realizing probably my time 
time is up. I, I've missed my chance, um, you know, through, through whatever. Um, Ash Hewitt actually at Brighton said, oh, mate, why don't you come try out the Philippines? And I said, oh, I can't at the moment doing my England County stuff. And he said, yeah, yeah, but when you finish that, you know, consider it. And um, I was supposed to go out a year before I actually did. So I, I emailed the general manager, Jake Letts, um, just to say hi, you know, my name's Rob, blah, blah, blah. My mum's half, uh, my mum's full Filipino. Um, I, I'm eligible to play. You know, can you tell me about future tournaments? Would it be possible to come out? Um, so I went out in 2018. Summer? Was it? Yeah, summer 2018. And, and that was for the 15s, actually, Asia Rugby Championships. And we had a, uh, two test matches against Singapore. And, um, and it, and from there, mate, without sounding too cringy, it's, it's changed my life. Um, not just the rugby side of it, but in terms of meeting family as well. So, so my granddad, my grandma, all my mum's side of the family. Um, never met them in 21 years. That, that was a big thing for me. Yeah. And then that's where I am today, just heavily involved with the 15s as well as the, um, the sevens as well with, with, with the Philippines. So, yeah, it's all good. Smashing. I mean, obviously looking at, so you start points where you are now. Um, I made a couple of notes that you've you've gone through a, a range of of levels. Obviously, from your college team yeah. to you know tap into Queens a little bit to England counties to then Philippines. Um, it'd be good to hear about the sort of different training environments and how they've they've all differed, but then how you think that's helped with your development? Because I imagine that not one's ever been the same, and it'd be good because obviously I, there won't be many people that have had that many different exposures to different environments. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be good to see the difference in environments and how you think that's aided your development. Yeah, I think um, a, a big thing for me making the, the transition from college rugby in, into men's rugby was, um, I think it was Ben Coulson, who, who's still coaching at, at Raiders at, at the time. He, he said to me, just, and it's something that's stuck with me now, be a student of the game. Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, in simple terms, always you know, just watch, watch rugby. And this is something I say to the boys that I coach at, who are 15, 16. I say, I don't think they watch enough rugby. And I think it's a massive thing. And and um, my missus hates it because I'm always always on my phone, you know, watching YouTube videos of, of of rugby is, you know, how can little things, how can I how can I pick up little things that, that players do? And even my old man said it to me when I was younger. He said, right, if we we're watching get England playing, he said, "Right, I want you to pick two players who who you want to you know emulate." So mine were Jason Robinson, purely just the fact that he could stand up a defender one on one. His acceleration was crazy. You know, Johnny Wilkinson because of his his influence of the game, being a, a defensive ten, which you didn't really see a lot of at that in that period of time. You know, his distribution, uh, how he controlled the game. Um, so that's that's probably the biggest thing for me. Um, obviously, in in terms of the coaching, I mean. Uh, for the Philippines, we've got Fran Obotic. I'm not sure if you 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 know the name, but he's a um, coach from New Zealand. Obviously, the the coaches that I've had in UK are all UK based, so their 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 styles are all different. And I've picked up um, I've picked up you know different things from them in terms of video analysis and how how detailed they are. We spend a lot of of time on that video analysis in the international stuff, which is, which is good. Um, so yeah. So building on, obviously, with that that little touch on the in, international stuff there, um, what does that competitive and training schedule look for you? I mean, in a corona-free world, yeah. Um, what would a typical sort of schedule look for yourself? Oh uh, yeah, so it's, international stuff. Yeah, so it's a good question. It's a difficult one for us. So pretty much all of um, all of our sevens boys and our fifteens. But if we're looking at the sevens, so. Um, you know, last year when we <clears throat> when we finished third in sorry in. 2018 when we finished third in the Asia series we were invited by um to to play in the Hong Kong sevens last year um as we finished third because it's all done all done regionally um the difficulty with our program is a lot of our boys or the majority of our boys play their rugby or live uh, overseas so out, actually outside of the Philippines um you know rugby in the Philippines is 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 growing but not not yet it's going to be yeah. 20 years time before we yeah. actually get full filipino boys playing at a good enough standard to represent the national team so a lot of our boys are from uk i think there's probably about in our seven squad there's probably about eight of us that live in uk 
uh, a lot of our boys live in Australia and New Zealand uh, and a couple in France and a couple in Italy as well. And there's only one or two that actually live and work in the Philippines. So in terms of our training schedule, it's difficult because say if we've got a scheduled tournament, so the Hong Kong Sevens, um, whenever it was in, in April, I believe, we would probably meet up two, three weeks before that. Whereas the, the teams that we play against, the likes of Hong Kong, um, you know, Tonga, um, Zimbabwe, I guess, they pretty much all live and train and work in those countries. So for us, it's, you know, right, boys, you've got two, three weeks. Obviously, the boys have been putting in the work back home, you'd hope. Now it's, we've got two, three weeks to gel and try and get a, a philosophy that, and, and structure of how we want to play. And um, to be fair, you know, we put up a, we put up a good fight. We don't we don't turn up to tournaments in terms of like the Hong Kong sevens. We, that was a massive experience. None of the boys, I think one or two of the boys previously experienced a rugby world cup in, in sevens, but that was, that was crazy for us. I mean, we beat Zimbabwe and that's the first time any, any Filipino side had beaten a team outside of Asia. So in Asia, we hold our own, we hold our own, we're usually top four. It's just now we want to try and get more exposure and playing the likes of, you know, Tonga, Zimbabwe, Jamaica, but it, it, it's difficult to do. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. It's just usually we have we'll have two two weeks to train together, two two training sessions a day, um, S and C in between that, and just a lot, a lot of rest and recovery and um, a lot of video analysis, um, trying to cram in as much as we can in that short space of time, really. <laughs> Yeah. So with that small preparation time prior to a tournament, yeah. you touched obviously there that you're hoping that um, everyone's been doing the bits away um, whilst they've been at home. So for you personally, uh, we'll start off with like, so you mentioned SSE there. What does your typical sort of strength conditioning month slash week look like? Yeah. Um, what, Corona free? Corona free, yeah. Corona free, yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean, I, I love training myself personally. I love training. I don't really see it as a chore, um, but you know, I would probably try and get in um, at least four conditioning sessions. So field-based conditioning sessions. Um, so things like hundreds, two hundreds, so tempo runs, all on a rolling clock. You know, um, so four conditioning sessions, um, three or four weight sessions, and at least one ideally two speed sessions as well. Um, that's what would, that's what my usual week would look like. Um, yeah. Correct. Smashing. And then building on from that, um, obviously goes hands in hand. So like your personal nutrition even. So, um, what do you do in terms of looking after that side of things? Yeah. I remember my missus hated me for this. Like when I was, I oh, sorry, this was most recent. This was last year when we had the, um, Olympic qualifiers and Southeast Asian games coming up, I was so anal with food. So I, I mean, I've never been one to be completely strict because, and that's because I know how much I train. So I know that if I, if I don't eat something great, like let's just say pizza, I know that I can, I can work that off the next day. Um, but I was getting to a stage sort of last year for the, for the Olympic qualifiers where I sort of had to justify if I had, okay, let's say if, I don't know, I had a donut. I would have to justify that. I'd be like, babe, right, I've got to do a 5K tonight. That's kind of, um, I was really hot on it. So, um, you know, my usual meals would be, you know, scrambled egg on toast or fried with a shake, some sort of, and then some Greek yogurt with strawberry, blueberry, a bit of honey. Lunch would be kind of, my usual would be steak, sweet potato, fries, and some, um, green beans or it could be some bagels with chicken spinach mayo and then dinner would be some sort of protein protein sauce you know chicken or um, steak again um, that's what my typical um, kind of diet would be to be honest probably two shakes a day as well one in the morning one just before bed um, yeah perfect and then uh, building on from that last kind of point on this is um, you've already kind of touched on it mentioning you know, being a student of the game, and I guess it kind of comes under that, but um, is there anything sort of mental prep, psychological prep that you do in the week um, prior to a tournament that you feel sets you up yeah. to perform yeah. at an optimal level? Some boys do, do, some boys don't, but... Yeah, one thing that was, um, that we actually used 
um, for the Olympic qualifiers and, and Southeast Asian Games that Frano brought in and, and David Johnson was visualization. And I know a lot of people talk about it. And, you know, me being a big UFC fan as well, Conor McGregor always talks about visualization. And a lot of people will just say, oh, it's all bullshit. But it was, it was just crazy, man, because I remember being in a hotel room. Um, we, the, the, the night before our first game against Singapore, we introduced, um, as captain and the leadership group, we introduced a visualization session um, that night. So I think after dinner where, where we would all turn the lights off, we'd literally lie down in, in, in Frano's room or whoever, whoever it was. And he would just basically, we would close our eyes and he would basically just talk through a, a possible scenario. And it wasn't up for discussion. It was just being in that place already. So if we, if we got to that place tomorrow morning, and similar things that Frano was articulating came up. We've already been in that position before, uh, and I'm not even I'm not even um, lying here. He words to the effect of he said that we will be 14 nil up against Singapore at half time in the first game of Olympic qualifiers, and I, I promised we were 14 nil up. It was crazy. He said that words to the effect of we'll get a scrum. We'll be sorry. We'll be 14 nil out. We've got an opportunity to to put twenty one nil, but I want to go in at half time fourteen nil, and someone will kick the ball out, and it actually happened. It was crazy, and that, that just might be a freak thing, but that's something that that for my own personal prep, you know, to play in my club rugby or wherever I play this season, is I think something that I'm going to introduce a night before a game, you know. And and another thing on on that is for me personally, and I don't know if all the boys do this, is just writing down. Um, but prior to a game, so maybe I was doing it an hour before a game. Right, what things do I want to achieve in this game? So if I've done my video analysis on this team that we're playing, so if it's Thailand, if it's Japan, you know, is there a weak link there? Is there something that I can, you know, w when am I going to take my opportunity? Um, so writing two things that, or two or three things that I really want to achieve in that game, whether it's hundred percent tackle completion, whether it's an assist, whether it's a try. Um, those are the kind of things that, that I do personally. I like that. Uh, just going back to the Conor McGregor one, because it's something that I've spent, because I'm a big fan of him as well, and he's, he talks about law of attraction all the time, and it's something that, um, not necessarily my rugby, but my, my just my personal life can introduce that, and that was massive for me. Yeah. Um, and then I think for people listening, the second point you made uh, about, or the third point you made, sorry, about writing stuff down, I've literally just watched... Uh, What's it called now? Chasing Great by Richie McCaw. Oh, yeah. There's literally a scene when he's in his bedroom and he's got a notepad and it's prior to um, then they're playing the Aussies the next day and he's, he just writes down like six things he wants to do in that game. Yeah, yeah. So some of these things just like be aggressive from the offset, you know, lead from the front, etc. Yeah, yeah. And then finish off with a great all black. As a, he finishes off with GAB, um, be a great all black, all black. So yeah. um, I think that's where Fran. I think that's where Fran got it from. I remember him yeah. saying now, someone out Richie McCaw or Dan Carter, just even, right after a game, even if they've what they've smashed the team, he write next job, next job, next job, and it's just like I think it just makes you accountable as well, man. Like, and if if you haven't achieved that in a game, I was looking at myself thinking, right, so why didn't I achieve that? Was I too focused on that? Was it you know process, not outcome? That was a thing, you know, kind of trigger words. So, you know, that, again, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great point you make because I think it's so so good to have. Yeah, I think sometimes you can get um, probably overwhelmed by the outcome. Yeah. And like you just said, like sticking to your processes and and getting, you, getting your little jobs right. And if everyone does that, obviously you're going to be on your way, hopefully, yeah. to, to work to the outcome. Um, mate, that was, that was class. So, as of now, I mean, obviously it's a bit weird with, Corona and stuff going on, and yeah. I don't know how much it's affected the tournaments, and I don't know what's been cancelled or, or or what so far. But um, where do you kind of see yourself going now um, over the next few years? So where do you really want to take your rugby career? Yeah, it's um, it's a difficult one. A lot, a lot of people are asking me actually with the, with this off time. Um, so I've got an agent at the moment um, who is working out in Australia. His name's Andrew Far Farbane. And we, two of our boys or a couple of our boys actually play professionally out in Japan. Um, so one of the boys from our seven squad, Janiko, who's half Philo, half uh, Australian, 
he was uh, picked up by Honda in the top league, and that's where R- you know RG Snyman, the second row for South Africa. Um, so he Janico signed a one year contract. I'm not sure if he's going back. So a lot of our boys with our Asian passports are looking um, to go out basically to Japan. Um, I mean, that's that's great for us personally, just obviously financially and exposure to playing at that level. But then it, it sort of it means that we can't do the international stuff as well. Um, I mean, to be honest, mate, that's where that's where I would that's where I'm aspiring to go at the moment. Once this is all over, is, is try and get a, a contract in Japan. Um, so I'm working heavily with my agent at the moment to do that. So I put a, together a highlights reel, and um, he's in contact with a few clubs for me. Um, so that, that's where I'd like to go, mate. Um, obviously, you know, I've got to be got to be realistic. Something may come up that may not happen. So um, and it all depends. It all depends with what happens with my job. So I'm, I'm working towards my PGCE and, and my teaching qualifications. So it all depends where I'm based, to be honest, mate. Unfortunately, where I'm based right now in, in Sussex or Brighton, the top clubs are Brighton and Worthing. And, and Worthing, I say only, but are only national too. Um, obviously, if I want to work towards national one champ, then I'd need to move to, to London, closer to London, ideally. Um, so again, that could be a potential option, but something that is is I haven't thought about right yet, uh, right now. Because um, I've got a pretty secure job, hopefully coming in, in September, um, which means I'll be I'll be based in Brighton still. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, like it seems obviously that you you wanted to progress your career, yeah, into obviously high leagues, etc. Um, and listen to you so far, you you seem very switched on in terms of. You prep and um, both from a physical standpoint, uh, technical, psychological, etc. So, is there anything that you think that you'll be working towards to kind of so you can tick that like the boxes you've got to tick for you to kind of make that step up again? Um, yeah. And if so, like how you think you'd probably go about it? Yeah, I think it's just um, for me. I know this is cliche, but I know I'm not the the complete player, so it's sort of asking myself. You're, okay, how do how do I get to that next level? So, you know, watching blokes that play in my position, um, you know, the likes of Manu Tuolangi, uh, Nani Laumape, Damien Dielande, um, you know, what I know this is stuff that stuck with me since I was a young kid. And, and obviously, like, like I mentioned previously, my dad told me to is just, you know, watch what they do. What can you, obviously, I haven't got the stature and the size of Manu, but, um, you know what? What else can I bring to my game, um, or, or what do they do that I I haven't got yet? Um, so I think it's it's probably just again just watching as much rugby as possible. Um, you know their game management, their ability to break the game line, their ability to offload. Um, you know any kind of yeah Owen Farrell because I like to be like a playmaking twelve as well, not just very one one dimensional. You know how does he control the game? Obviously, his leadership and that's that's massive as part of the, as as sevens captain. You know how he stamps his authority with, with the England boys. I think that's great. So, I think it's just it's just watching more rugby. I think a big thing for me in this off season is is working on my speed, um, and that's something that a coach told me once when I was 15, 16. He said you'll always. He said to me and my dad. He said you'll always have the size there. He says I don't. I'll, you know, there's no question that you'll always be able to put on muscle. It's just speed kills and, and and it's so true and that's something that I've been I've been working on and will continue to work on is, is that speed you know that ability to that acceleration that first five to ten meters and then you're gone you know previously previously I would have that and then I would get I, would, I wouldn't gas but my my top end would, it would, I would you know that repeated sprint ability I wouldn't be able to to carry that out so, f- so for this season I just want to work on my speed, make a break and then finish it off, not assist someone. I want to finish it off myself. Um, yeah, I think that's that's where I want to take my game and, and just continue, you know, honing on the on the small skills, your passing, your kicking, your your game management, your tackling. Breakdown as well is a big thing, I think. I've neglected in the past, but, you know, to, as a sense, you're essentially a, another back rower, aren't you? So, you know, you may only get one or two a game, but that might be the... That might be the turnover that, that changes the game or, or changes that momentum for your team. Yeah. 
good to hear you talk about the speed stuff as well. A lot of people um, message myself um, and then a few of the people that I work with. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people chase is that speed. Yeah. Because um, I think people are coming aware to the fact that it doesn't matter if, if you're in the front row yeah. or um, you're out on the wing somewhere, like speed can be an asset to every single position. Yeah. Um, and hearing you say that you're actually working on your actual speed work and not just hoping to do gym work and get fast. It's yeah, fantastic yeah. because people don't realise that to get fast, you've actually got to do some some sprinting and some specific yeah. work. So, cheers for saying that. Yeah, <laughs> was, I um, think a lot, of, a lot of the boys that I coach as well, um, you know, they're 15, 16, and they're like, oh, Mr. Fogarty or Sir, how, how do I get faster? And and without sounding like a prick, you know, you've just got to sprint. Yeah, and no, mate, it's I've true. just got on my phone. Actually, funny that we're talking about it. There's a guy called Brian Mack who said, Words to the effect of: If you want to be better at basketball, play basketball. If you want to be better at piano, play piano. If you if you want to, you know, whatever. And he said, but now's not the time for power and speed as power athletes to become mile runners. I see a lot, a lot of my mates that I play with. They're doing five, ten, fifteen k. I'm like, yeah, great. But when are you ever running at that speed during a, a game? Everything that we do, especially as a back, is with the acceleration. You have got to get somewhere in minimal time as possible. So I'd rather do like a, a 15, 20K cycle, still building up my legs and still building my engine, but all my running base stuff is conditioning, you know, high speed running or just pure 10 to 50 meters, 10 to 20 meters, just pure acceleration speed work. Yeah, um, 100%. It's um, with some of the work that I do with the, the league club that I'm currently at, um, the conditioning based work that we all do and the work that I do with all my clients, unless the rehab clients, is it's that idea of make sure we're training with intensity. Yeah. Um anybody can plod for five K. Yeah. I mean, I ain't running, I can plod for five K. Yeah. Um but it's that actual training with intensity that's that's gonna make the difference, like you said there. Um but it is true and it's just, and it go, going back to what you said a minute like if you want to be better at piano, play piano, it's the same with uh with rugby and I think that sometimes um without without slagging people off, strength conditioning coaches can sometimes get caught up in their own bubble thinking that it's the be all and end all. Like if you want to get better at rugby, play rugby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas an SSE coach might tell you to get better at rugby, you've got to get fit. It's not the case, but it is true about obviously speed work. Um, I like that analogy. Um, I think, we're, I think some people are just guilty of always looking for, I've done a, my degrees in S and C. Um, we're always looking, there are always people who are always looking for supplementary exercises. So, you know what, okay. What new exercise in the gym you know, lower, lower body posterior or whatever exercise, can I give this athlete that's going to make it faster? Yes, there are supplementary exercises that will help, but you've just got to get out on the field and sprint. Yeah, that's well, it's like um, P, uh, getting caught up in like the sports specific bubble. I mean, P, when you look at my programming, it probably looks pretty boring because yeah. we squat, we push, we, there's nothing that's like, obviously the, the periodization is there and it's progressive to a certain point that we get the outcome that we want. It's yeah. probably going to, be the difference but there's nothing there's no exercises in there that are fucking like you know brand new yeah, it's yeah, yeah. we squat you know we push we pull just you know keeping things simple so yeah it's good to hear yourself obviously from the SSC standpoint but obviously the player standpoint say that as well so yeah. cheers for that mate that was um that was spot on really appreciate that i think uh, people get a lot from it yeah, yeah.